Take a seat so we could get started with the afternoon program. Or you could keep talking and ignore me. Why don't you just keep talking and ignore me? That's okay. Yes. But we're going to get started anyway. So, welcome to the penultimate session of this second day of our symposium. And we're going to start off with a presentation entitled Time Binding, Wealth, and Superabundance, all the way from the great state of Michigan, from Grand Valley State University. It's Corey Anton. Wow, thank you for that very kind introduction, Lance. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I, I should get up my, my timer here so I can keep my wits about me. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is called Time Binding Wealth and Superabundance. And this is actually a smaller part of a larger project that Tom Jen Corelli and I had started maybe last year. I think some people are aware that we're doing a special issue and perhaps a book on politics and general semantics. And what I'm going to focus on here is we mentioned in this title of Time Binding Wealth and Superabundance. In some way, I'm trying to really dig into what I'm taking at least at this point in my life, at this, at this moment, uh, three of the most important chapters from Korzybski's book, Manhood of Humanity. The three chapters are Wealth, the Capitalistic Era, and Survival of the Fittest. I, again, for me, where I'm at right now, I think these are some of the, the readings. If you're not familiar with these in Korzybski, go get Manhood of Humanity, start studying those up, and join the conversation. What I'm going to try to do is give a quick review of it, an update of it, and then see if we can consider some of the implications uh, for the situations we're in right now. I think the first thing to say is that, is that you know, when Korzybski first came upon his notion of time binding, it came from his understanding, from a lot of different sources, but one of the main insights, it came from mathematics and his understanding that there was a rigorous difference between a point, a line, a surface, and a cube. That mathematically, these have different properties, and you can't reduce the properties of the cube down to the surface or a line. And so there's an additive, like, new dimensions, new properties, where something, again, novel gets introduced, but it's not reducible in the other direction. And Krzyzewski then took that metaphorically and said, there must be something like that in life more generally. And so the, the analysis, you know, as it broke down was something like, you know, the, the point is the inorganic elements of life. The line is the chemistry binding that goes on across plants and other non-animal sort of life forms. The surface becomes the space binding part of life. And then the cube uniquely represents humanity. And as I think you know, you know, many people know this, right? Korzybski's claim was that humans are not animals. Humans, to call a human an animal is sort of like calling a surface a cube. Or I'm sorry, it's calling a cube surface. It's like trying to understand a qualitatively different phenomena through simpler uh, forms of phenomena. And so when Korzybski is talking about time binding, he is talking about that unique uh, class of life that he designates as humanity. And one of the ways to get at it is to say, well, what exactly are these properties that Korzybski is saying aligns with the, the time binding class of life? And properties is such a great word there. Because I think, if you add, and this is the way Korzybski comes at it, he would basically say, do animals have wealth? The answer is no. That animals do not have wealth as we understand it. And if you think about what we mean by time binding, that's what really what we're talking about. Wealth, I think we could talk about it and say, well, we have culture. And that's, again, a different way of what Korzybski is going to talk about, this kind of uh, 
abundance of, of surplus goods and of techniques and of procedures, of things that get left in the wake, and that humans are a kind of wealthy class of life. We're all living in the wake of the dead. That is, the dead have given an immense amount of toil, produced so many things, and now we have all inherited that by our birthright uh, as human. Now, what does it mean to speak about wealth? Again, there's a lot of different ways to come at wealth. I'm just going to go with what Korzybski's talking about. Instead of talking about capital and some of these other things, what Korzybski says is there's really two different things. There's potential use values and kinetic use values. Uh, now, when he's talking about potential use values and kinetic use values, the simplest way to do it is he's talking about material culture and immaterial culture. He's talking about the stuff that gets left behind, and he's talking about the information that's uh, also transmitted across multiple generations. So when I'm talking about potential use values, I'm talking about things like dwellings, buildings, artifacts, objects, roads, bridges, could be tools, those things that get left behind that could be used by a given individual or, or by a collective. Kinetic use values, interestingly, Korzybski says that they're not limited and they don't have to really be repaired. In some way, they're kind of open to eternity and they're things like techniques, methods, maneuvers, procedures, recipes, practices. It could be something just as novel as language itself or even forms of writing. Now, when we're talking about the, this issue of superabundance, uh, the, the claim here is that we are the wealthy animal, and that wealth has been accruing at least since, you know, we could say all the way back into human history, but it, it, something significant happened during the agricultural revolution some, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, and then something really radically happened around 7,000 years ago with the invention of the alphabet. Then the printing press, it starts to accelerate. 1850, the telegraph hits, and now you're getting kinetic use values proliferating. They're being distributed globally, and you're seeing the beginning of superabundance. Today, superabundance, what I'm talking about it is it's post-telegraph. It's the computer, the internet, and now all these different generative AI systems that are soon enough going to be able to do about anything you want at the push of a, a few keystrokes. So... I think to, in order to really get at what we mean by uh, superabundance, it, it is both. There's a proliferation of both um, potential use values as well as kinetic use values. But the kinetic use values seem to be even more easily distributed, amplified, and, and spread around uh, on the globe. And let me make very clear right here. This is not necessarily a good thing. I'm not advocating the age of superabundance. I'm saying, wake up. We're here. Uh, we need to grow up as a you know, Korzybski's project of getting from the childhood of humanity to the manhood of humanity, as poorly titled as that is, uh, I, think, I think his point is that, again, we, we can't be childish. It's never been more important for people to grow up in order to be sane in the age of superabundance. So first, let me give a couple examples of what I mean by the pros, the benefits, as it were, of the age of superabundance. And then I'll try to talk about some of the the negatives or the cons that go with it. I think the the pros are probably pretty easy for all of us to identify. I mean, we live in climate controlled environments. There's comfort and ease, uh, convenience. Uh, people can have entertainments from around the world at the push of a button. And if you think about it, uh, you know, there, there may admittedly be a growing disparity between the haves and the have nots, but the have nots have almost never had it better. Uh, that is like, if you were poor, today in the U.S., it's much better off than being poor, say, in ancient Rome, and in the same way that you could be fairly wealthy in ancient Rome, and probably middle-class U.S. citizens might have it a lot better, according to a lot of things. Everything from, like, you know, germ theory to, uh, you know, morphine and other forms of, of pain relief. Um, you know, Wikipedia would maybe be another example. Uh, middle-class life throughout the 20th century people bought encyclopedias. And encyclopedias were a pretty hefty expense, but they were seen to be worth it because of the wealth of information that was provided. Imagine right now trying to print out Wikipedia. I mean, the amount of information that is available to us all, it's, it's really quite amazing. If you go to YouTube, 
you can find kinetic use value, the potential use value. You can be entertained by movies and songs and that stuff. But the amount of kinetic use value there, it's absolutely astonishing. So I just recently won a guitar. Woo, it was weird. I don't play guitar. I don't play. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, but it's funny. If you, if you had won a guitar, say, 100 years ago at some music festival, you kind of had to know a couple of people, give you advice, or start this. Now the amount of advice you can get on technique Technique and procedure there, it's, it's really quite mind blowing. Um, I'll say one last thing about the some of the things here. I, I would encourage people to either write this down or look it up. I'm going to say this and you're going to doubt it, uh, but go look up the video called Google Strikes Back. Google Strikes Back. It's one of their most recent uh, events where they announced some of their accomplishments. They were talking about Google's Alpha Fold, the AI system that predicts the folding of proteins. The statement was, and this is Quote, the statement was, in the past few weeks, we have done the equivalent of 400 million years worth of research. 200 million proteins can now be accurately predicted in their folding, basically all known proteins. What does this all mean? I don't think any of us really have a sense yet. Uh, we're, still, we're still in the infancy of that. Okay, now let's talk about the cons. The cons uh, are, they're really rich because what happens is there is... Just as there isn't any economic situation, there's a kind of inflation that's going on, and the term that I'm using, I'm using the paper is called symbolic inflation. Symbolic inflation of the kinetic use values. What I mean by that is that what was an accomplishment for a certain generation at a certain point in time becomes the baseline expectation for the next generation. That is, there's no way to be illiterate in an oral society. Today, in our modern literate society, where literacy is part of those kinetic use values, we assume that people can be literate, or they will be literate, or they will be at a disadvantage. Um, but, you know, the, the symbolic inflation means a lot of different things. I mean, some of it has to do with on buttons. You know, when you push an on button... Uh, an on button gives you access to a world that potentially goes on without you. And I'm talking about things like TV, radio, uh, internet, this kind of stuff. And it's led, I think, many people into a kind of bystander, onlooker, spectator position in life. People are having difficulty learning how to engage in life because there's, again, this sort of ease and comfort and convenience of having food delivered at the push of a button, of playing video games that have a kind of instant gratification, very little steep learning curve, as it were. On the other hand, again, notice what's happening on the other hand. Uh, there is this radical symbolic inflation that's occurring um, in the kinetic use values. I'll try to give a couple of really quick examples here. Um, just, again, I encourage anybody to go do this. You go to YouTube. Look at what you needed to do to win the gold medal in the gymnastics competition in the Olympics in, say, 20, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, 1960. And then go look at what you needed to do to get the gold in gymnastics in 2016. Uh, your jaw will drop when you look at the differences of those performances. I mean, it's the, the, the a curve is really high up there. You know, young people today, they can access all kinds of around the world. And they're seeing kids doing bikes, you know, um, skateboards and all kinds of other, you know, acts of daring. Some people, it's elevating and exciting. And to up on, live up to this. I think this is partly why you're seeing a lot of people who are consuming porn but not having sex. They're sort of like, well, I can't compete with professional sex workers. I don't even know how to. It just seems like there's a lot of pressure, right? And again, there's just you. You can go on to YouTube and you can find videos of kids watching other people. And this is, you know, my father. Was a was a ship, ended up playing college basketball, and then he also played college football and went on to play semi pro football. Today, that's utterly impossible. Not only are children from a young age into a particular sport, but collegiate athletes, when they get a scholarship, they have to sign a waiver showing that they will not participate in any other sport. So, like a major school, and you're a football player, you can't be playing volleyball on the beach. You will be playing kickball like that's a violation because you may get hurt right so what does all this leave us i'm gonna to try to wrap up here i see i have basically about a minute i think i want to say uh, uh, two two general comments one is that the super smart agis are right around the corner go check out the site called 360 abundance on youtube quantum computers are going to be here i think for some people 
much quicker than they realize. I mean, there's nine different systems. Some of them operate at room temperature. I mean, this stuff is really happening quite quickly. But here's the deal. No matter how much all of these artificial intelligence systems are going to be able to do, and they're going to be able to do a lot, there's still going to be this whole realm of you cultivating yourself. Because it's, it's, it's the one thing that's going to be left that the AI can't do. Like the AI, it may be able to give you suggestions on a better diet. It can't eat the food for you. It may give you, you know, advice on how to exercise. It can't do your sit-ups. It may give you advice on how to play the guitar better, but it's not going to play the guitar for you instead of just it's playing the guitar and you're not. So there's going to be nothing left to do but grow ourselves in the wake of the AI, the coming onslaught. The other thing I would say about that, and this is Korzybski's line, he says a lot of people are ghouls. He says they live as ghouls. That is, they don't realize that they're preying upon the riches that the dead have left. And so that the task I think that he left for us, and this is what, what I would encourage everyone to, to think about, is that each of us are, we're harvesting and enjoying the wealth of previous generations. The task is to make sure in all of your uh, consuming of the wealth that you do, how excellent and how robust of kinetic use values and potential use values are you giving back to the world? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Corey. <laughs>